Jeff and uh, welcome to our service today and um, another session of our series, uh, The Anatomy and Operation of the New Creation. Uh, we started this a few weeks ago now and we've been exploring um, the, the new creation um, after the order of the last Adam. Um, before we get into the word this morning, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful. Uh, we're filled with gratitude uh, for your work in us. Uh, we're filled with gratitude uh, for our union with Christ and the, the plan of redemption. Uh, that we are joined together um, as one community with you and with one another. So Lord, we just give you thanks for that. Lord, as we explore uh, more of the anatomy and operation of the new creation, we ask that through the power of your spirit, you light our candles and enlighten our darkness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, uh, because you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. You are the Lord in the church, and we're so grateful uh, for your presence and your guidance uh, through this exciting and adventurous journey um, of life and expression of the kingdom in all we do. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we've been looking at the uh, the anatomy and um, an operation of the new creation, and we've spent uh, a little bit of time uh, looking specifically at uh, righteousness. Um, there's a quote I gave last week of a, uh, an NBA championship coach, and he said that, um, you know, you can never win until you think you are worthy to win. Um, and, and righteousness actually speaks concerning our worth. Um, it's not just um, wishful thinking or, or positive thinking. It speaks about our worth in Christ and what God has made us in Christ. You know, Romans 8, 1, which we'll be looking at a little bit later on, um, it, it said that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It says, for the law of the spirit of life has made us free from the law of sin and death. And God has done um, what, what could not be achieved by the law. He, he achieved in Christ what could not be achieved by the law. So understanding righteousness and, and um, really uh, opens us up into living the life of Christ the way it is supposed to be lived, a life of joy, a life of peace, uh, and a life of adventure. You know, um, in Romans 1.17, we looked at Romans 1.17 last week, and I quoted um, a, a line from the Lovitz translation, uh, speaking about the gospel, um, you know, Romans 1 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He says, it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. For in it, um, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, in the gospel, you know, the gospel, uh, euangelion, is good news. Uh, good news. There is good news uh, that was not available under what we call the Old Testament. There's good news that has been heralded after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And it says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So Lovett's translation of that statement puts it this way. He says, the gospel reveals God's way of making men as righteous as himself. The gospel reveals God's way of making men as righteous as himself. Okay? I almost feel like I need to pause at that statement. God has a way of making men as righteous as himself. And the word men there is generic. Male and female, he made he, them, Genesis 1 says. Um, God has a way, and that way has been revealed in Christ, in the work of the last Adam, in whom we have our life. The gospel reveals God's way of making men as righteous as himself. N now, um, clearly, this righteousness is a righteousness that we are made. Okay, it's not a righteousness that we achieve. It is something that we are made. It is a state we enter into. And, and that is why um, 
Ephesians 4.24 is so important. We looked at it last, last week where it says, and be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness. So righteousness is a state because God created us in his perfect righteousness and we now belong uh, to him in the realm of true holiness. The word righteousness is the Greek word diakosune and it speaks about a rightness, a rightness of nature. Yeah, a, a, a nature that um, from this verse is as right as God is right. A, a nature that is truly accepted by him. A nature that is in union with him. A nature that comes from him. We looked at Ephesians 2.10. Talk about being the handiwork, the masterpiece of God. Um, created in Christ Jesus. Yes. Uh, created in Christ Jesus. Okay. Created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. We're created after God. Created after God. In righteousness so righteousness is the state of our creation okay and the gospel reveals that it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament it's revealed in the gospel um, God's way of making men as righteous as himself okay and, and uh, you, you know we, we, we only um, walk in the light of what has been revealed we can only be transformed after um, we have received revelation and embraced revelation and come into experience of revelation and that is why these truths cannot just be memorized uh, these truths must be uh, must be embraced and we must immerse ourselves in them um, as a conscious practice through meditation that's the only way it's going to happen because it needs to, until we understand our rightness, our rightness of nature from which righteous acts proceed, uh, we will be limited in the expression of the life that is in Christ. Okay. And we'll, we will be limited in our ability to receive the faith, um, all that God has already made available to us by his grace. So our hearts must be established in grace. In fact, if you look at um, Hebrews 13, verse 9, Hebrews 13, verse 9, the New King James says, I'm going to read from several translations. It says, don't be carried away, um, don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not foods uh, and which are not profited, which have not profited those who have been occupied by them. It is, it is good that the heart be established to be established means to be fully grounded, to be settled by grace. You see, when it comes to the architecture of our spiritual man, um, yes, we have a new nature in Christ, but it says that the heart should be established. The word heart there is the Greek word cardia, and, and the, the word cardia is it's it 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 compasses the 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 whole um, framework of <coughs> us spiritual operation what i mean by that is you know the, the heart is is like a, a a a combination of your spirit and your soul your soul is the vehicle through which spiritual truths that are received find expression through our lives it, it affects our consciousness uh, you you cannot be conscious of something unless it is in your soul yeah you, you may be a new creature and you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, but until that consciousness permeates your soul, you will not walk in the light of it. Yeah, And that's why it says it's important that the heart be established by grace. The establishment of the heart by grace is not just something God does. It is something that, um, that we do through receiving and embracing the truth um, in our hearts. It is only then that it's like we are given um, expression to the nature and the power that is resided that resides in our um, our inner man or in our spirit. Okay, so it is through meditation into these truths um, that 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 the life 
of the heart or the life of the spirit finds expression um, in our lives. That, that is only when it becomes reality in our experience. So it is how we deal with revelation, how we treat revelation, how we incorporate revelation that determines uh, what receives expression through our lives. And in the spirit, it is actually a real thing. Uh, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that is embraced through revelation is, 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 uh, is, is, is clear um, in our spiritual man. It becomes part of our spiritual um, equipment, if you like, our ability to see, to move, to, to, to make uh, progress in spiritual dimensions is determined by how much the truth or the reality that Christ has made available to us finds expression through our hearts. <clears throat> Another translation that I want to look at here is, um, I believe this is the NIV. It says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, uh, which is of no benefit to those who do so. Um, the action of roles, um, you know, roles, uh, religious dogma, I mean, some of these rules are good, um, but it says they, they, they have no benefit. They have no benefit. Uh, they have no benefit. Uh, no benefit. The Unilever translation that we read earlier said, um, oh, so we didn't read that. It says, don't be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food, which do not help those who follow them. Yeah, your strength comes from God's grace not from rules, okay? Religion always tries to change you from the outside in. Um, uh, true spirituality um, starts with creation on the inside. And then as we align with it and embrace it through revelation, uh, we enter into experiences that transforms our external man. The last translation I want to read is the Passion Translation, which, as you know, is my favorite. It says, don't let anyone lead you astray with all sorts of exotic and novel teachings. It is more beautiful to feast on grace, on grace and be inwardly strengthened than to be obsessed with dietary rules which in themselves have no lasting benefit. There are a lot of things that we engage in that have no lasting benefit. But it says here that it's a beautiful thing when we feast on grace. To feast means to abundantly indulge, to immerse yourself, okay, in what God has made available to us in Christ through his grace, his version of righteousness, his way of making us as righteous as himself. That's what we need to feast on. Don't feast on anything else. Let's focus. Let's feast on that. And as we feast on that, it will be, we'll be inwardly strengthened, okay, and, and we would actually have lasting benefit because we'll be able to engage um, accurately and properly um, with all we have been given in Christ. You, you, you know, embracing righteousness, as I said a few weeks ago, <clears throat> God's version of righteousness and the true ramifications of what he reveals concerning our righteousness in him will separate us from any kind of religious thinking because the righteousness of God is truly embraced or truly immersed or embedded in God's grace, what God and God alone did for us in Christ. As I said, yes, uh, as I said last week, there are 11 things that a righteousness consciousness will do for us. And I just felt led to just focus on those 11 things today. Uh, just taking a few verses of scripture. Um, uh, I probably gave about two verses for each reference, but I'll just spend uh, one, uh, I'll just spend time going through one verse. And this is for our immersion. We want to we want to meditate on these things. We want to feel our hearts. We want our hearts to feast on these truths. Uh, the 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 implications of that will be obvious as we proceed. Everything that we're able to engage with in the spiritual realm, in the realm of heaven, in the multiverses of God, is gonna be determined by our. Um, our understanding of our righteousness in him. If you look at scripture and see how Moses was able to stand before the Lord and when the Lord said, stand aside, let me destroy this people. And, and Moses stood and said, 
um, you know that um, that Lord do not do what you have what you have uh, what you have determined um, and he he stood before God it is an understanding of righteousness that allows you to stand before the creator of all things the one who alone is uncreated the one who is omniscient omnipresent the one who is omnipotent the one who the heavens behold and they flee it is only um, a heart that is established in righteousness like Abraham that would stand before uh, Yahweh and say, will not the God of all the universe do right? Do not do this thing. It is only a man that stands in righteousness that will be able to command the elements of the heavens and the earth and they would listen to his voice. That will call the armies um, of heaven into battle array to follow the sound of his voice. That will stand against the accuser uh, and stand with that sense of understanding and resist him and f and experience him fleeing. So we're going to look at 11 things that Mark Hankins identified that a righteousness consciousness uh, will do for us. And, and, and for us, we want to use these things to, as it were, reconstruct the, the framework of our souls uh, regarding who we are and um, what is ours. Um, in this new creation. The first thing he said was that it will free us from every sense of guilt, every sense of guilt. If you look at Romans chapter 8 verse 1, I'm going to be reading from the um, Passion Translation unless I state otherwise. It says, so now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. The case is closed concerning your life. There remains no accusing voice, no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. I could, I could insert a couple of words in there without changing the meaning of it. There are no accusing voices of reckoning, of significance, that will be entertained in the very presence of God. Any accusation that comes before you in the very presence of God is immediately shut down. There's no accusing voice that will be entertained. You know how, uh, you know, in a court of law, um, where, you know, uh, evidence is brought um, you know, and some evidence is considered inadmissible in court, either because it was in, uh, it was um, it was um, obtained through illegal means, or it's just irrelevant. Um, what the Bible is saying here is that the case concerning your life is closed, because you're in Christ. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation. Any condemnation that is leveled against you in the presence of God is going to be considered inadmissible. Yeah, there's no accusing voice. So you can come before the presence of God without any sense of guilt. Because through what Christ has done, um, there is no accusing voice against you. If you look at, um, if you look at Hebrews 9, uh, 13 to 14, it explains why there is no accusing voice against us. In verse 13 of Hebrews 9, it says, Under the old covenant, the blood of bulls, goats, and the ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them out outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. Yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciences? For by the power of the eternal spirit, he has offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice that now frees us from our dead works to worship and serve the living God. Now, of course, the book of Hebrews was written to the Jews and they understood that. You see, there is a difference between um, your righteousness and your consciousness of your righteousness, okay? It is possible um, for somebody to be 
declared not guilty and the prison doors open wide and yet that person stays in prison okay now the ability of this understanding of righteousness to cleanse our conscience from um, cleanse our consciences is hinged on our understanding of the efficacy of the blood of Jesus. Okay. Um, the Jews to whom um, this was being written understood what the writer was talking about here. Because you see, under the Old Testament, um, you know, God introduced the law of sacrifices. And um, uh, particularly on the Day of Atonement, which was once a year, uh, they would bring, um, you know, the blood of bulls and goats and they covered their, their, um, their uh, sins for a year. Um, but, but there was something very significant about, about how that process took place. The very first sacrifice that was, um, it, when this was introduced to the Jews, it was um, the Passover lamb, and uh, which happened in the, uh, you know, in the land of Egypt, you know, the, the, the final plague, or, or not the final plague, but after the final plague, the Passover, um, the, it was a night when, when, um, when, um, when the, 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 the first sons or the, the first bonds were killed, but, but that was the, that was when the sacrifice of the Passover was instituted. And in, in Exodus 12 verse five, you know, when the Lord was giving the children of Israel through Moses, the instructions about the Passover lamb, he made an important statement. He said, the animal you select must be a one year old male, either sheep or goat with no defects, with no defects. And, and when this animal was killed, a, 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 an animal without defect, the blood of that sinless lamb, yeah, as it were, uh, uh, covered their sins. And of course, this is a type of the Lord Jesus, for whom John said, this is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, or the sin of the world. Um, so when you come before the Father um, as a sinner, okay, he doesn't inspect you, he inspects the lamb that is representing you. That's what happened in the Old Testament. It was a lamb brought before the, the Lord, a lamb without defects. Now, Jesus, um, like Hebrews says, okay, um, offered himself to God as a lamb without defect. And that lamb was, ex was um, inspected. And as a result of the the, the purity of that lamb, the blood of that lamb cleansed our sins and, and rendered us righteous in God's presence. Now we take that understanding and allow it to cleanse our consciences from dead works, okay? Our conscience is that word, that, that voice in your inner man that speaks concerning your eligibility. When we apply um, that understanding of the efficacy of the blood on our consciousness, it would cleanse us from dead works. It would, it would, it would, it would bring us into a place of consciousness of acceptance in the very presence of God. Yeah, because God has cleansed us. Um, we are righteous in His sight, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ, and that's why Ephesians one. Um, talks about the fact that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings because he sees us wrapped in Christ. We are in Christ and therefore uh, we have his nature. We have been rendered not guilty and we are not only rendered not guilty, but we have his very nature of rightness within us because we are in union with Christ. So righteousness, consciousness will free us from every sense of guilt. Okay. Um, number two, it will free us from the frustration of struggling to be accepted by God. Okay? Um, am I pleasing to God? That is, that is a, a question we all ask, either consciously or unconsciously. If you look at Ephesians 1, 
um, I'll read verses 5 to 6. It says, For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the Anointed One, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love he has for the beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure okay that struggle of trying to be accepted by god um will be removed from our lives when we accept the truth of what god has done the bible says that because of what god has done the same love he has for his beloved one jesus he has for us yeah we are accepted in the beloved the same love that he has for his beloved one jesus he has for us so you can be at peace the struggle is over you don't need to struggle for acceptance you know in families unfortunately you know they are family favorites and you have kids jockeying for position for the love of their father and their mother and it's like how good can i be today so that dad would love me like he loves the first or the second or his favorite. That doesn't happen in the family of God. It says the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. Jesus even said that in John 17, that they may know that as you have loved me, so you love them. Okay, so that struggle for acceptance by God is over. There's nothing you can do to make yourself more accepted or less accepted by God than you are right now. Number three, it will free us from the consequences of sin that are in this world. Okay? The consequences of sin. The soul that sins shall die, as Ezekiel 18.20 says. Our righteousness consciousness will free us from the consequences of sin that are in this world. You're going to be unaffected by the consequences of sin that are in this world. Um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, And there's still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, You are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. Through this, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. You know, the Bible says that in him we have re remission um, for our sins. We have redemption through his blood, even the remission of our sins or the forgiveness of our sins. You know, um, all your sins have been forgiven, the past, the present and the future. Um, because of the sacrifice of his blood. You see, a righteous consciousness is the key to living right. When you embrace the love of God that has made you right with him, it is from that place that righteous acts uh, proceed. So you, you cannot understand a righteousness and embrace a life of sin, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But the truth of the fact is that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Bible says you will never experience the wrath of God. And that frees us from fear. It frees us from every sense of insecurity. It embeds this consciousness that we're accepted and loved by the Lord, irrespective of what others may tell us. Um, it embeds that consciousness in our hearts. And we can operate as accepted sons of God, even as we grow in the expression of righteousness in our lives through right action. Number four, our righteous consciousness will produce a sense of peace and security in our relations with God and man. Romans 8.31 says, so what does it all mean after the treatise that Paul wrote in Romans 8 talking about what God has done for us in Christ and the implications of that? He says, what does this all mean? If God has determined to stand with us, tell me who then could ever stand against us? 
Now, of course, people will try to stand against us, but they will never be successful because if you've got God on your side, you know, it is said that God, God, and, uh, God, God and us is a, is a majority, and that's absolutely true. It says if God will stand for you, hey, tell me who could ever stand against us and the implication in there is who can stand against us successfully. Um, yeah, it, it, this will produce a sense of peace and security in our relations with God and man. Um, you know, our security in God is based on the fact that we have his nature and he loves us like he loves his son. Um, and therefore, uh, we're not impressed with human beings. We're not afraid of human beings. Um, we, we don't have to kowtow to anybody. Uh, we love and respect people, but people's view of you do not determine um, the outcome of your life. Okay? Um, your life is established in God. Your purpose is established in Him. Um, yeah. You know, so there is no reason to be afraid of people. In fact, I heard um, Rick Joyner say once that when you've seen the Lord, you, you're not so impressed with men. Um, you can't, no one can impress you if, if you've actually been with the Lord. No king, no head of state can impress you because you have already seen the King of Kings. You don't have to have a vision of Jesus for this to be the case. Uh, you just need to embrace the truth that you are loved by the Lord. If you're loved by the Lord, um, the accolades or the condemnation of man would, would leave you largely unaffected because your security is in him. Number five, a righteous consciousness will cause our whole being to swing over into harmony with God. It will cause our whole being to be in alignment with God. You know, there are certain things that the Lord is revealing at this time. And there's certain parts of his purpose for your life that he's unveiling that would be too big for your mind to embrace if it is not established and rooted in righteousness. Because you consider yourself, um, you consider yourself um, unqualified um, for this. Because when we think about qualification, we think about our worth. Okay, uh, but it's when you see that your worth is in Christ, when you see that when your worth is determined by Christ and not your past actions, then you will be able to respond to the revelation of God by faith. But if your worth is in yourself, you will withdraw from the revelation of what he has prepared for you. So this is an essential foundation for us to operate as sons of God in this time. Um, so Romans chapter five, verse one says, our faith in Jesus, transfers God's righteousness to us and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. So he has declared us flawless in his eyes. If we are flawless in his eyes, then we qualify for everything that he wants to give us. You qualify for it because you're flawless in his eyes. You can come boldly before his throne to obtain mercy and find grace to help. You can stand before your father as one who is flawless in his eyes because he has transferred his rightness to us. Okay, It was a transfer that took place when you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are flawless in his eyes. Uh, number six, it will free us from oppression and fear. From oppression and fear. You know, the kind of oppression that fear brings uh, is shown in Genesis 3, 9 to 10 in the Garden of Eden um, when Adam and Eve sinned, sinned and the Lord called to them in verse 9 of Genesis 3. He says, where are you? And Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid because I was afraid. I took actions away from your presence because of fear. And my fear was based on um, my, uh, my sense of uh, a lack of worth. I have fallen short of your glory 
I've disobeyed you and therefore um, I am afraid of you. You know, they had no reason to be afraid of God because God loved them. Uh, but their, their sin caused a separation between them and God. But a righteous conscience will free us from oppression and fear. It's interesting that First John 1 9 says that um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, so basically saying that, okay, if, if, uh, if you do sin, come directly to his presence, okay, and confess your sin before him. All right, your sin does not um, does not uh, change the state of, of acceptance uh, by him. Okay, um, anytime we fall short, anytime we make mistakes or sin, uh, sin does not change your state of righteousness. Okay, um, you know it, it affects your fellowship with the Lord um, because your conscience, your conscience would certainly. Uh, condemn you of sin but whenever or if ever we sin we run to him and we confess our sins and we embrace his forgiveness because we he has forgiven us um, he has forgiven us in Christ because in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of all our sins when we ask him uh, when we when we repent of sin or when we acknowledge sin in our lives and come before his presence it is not because there's any question concerning the outcome of that engagement okay because our sins are already forgiven. Every sin you commit, you'll ever commit, is forgiven. Um, but we come before God because we love him and we protect our fellowship with him um, as, we, as we receive grace to overcome every sin in our lives. Number seven, a righteous consciousness will free us from every sense of inadequacy. Any sense of inadequacy because um, we, we can boldly say, like Hebrews 13, 5 says, or 6 says, that the Lord is our helper. Um, the Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5 says, don't be obsessed with money, but live content with what you have. For you always have God's presence. For hasn't he promised you, I'll never leave you alone, ever. I will never leave you alone, never. I will not loosen my grip on your life. So we can say with great confidence, I know the Lord is for me and I'll never be afraid of what people may do to me. Okay, it will free us from every sense of inadequacy because the, level, the Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In fact, he says he will never loosen his grip on your life. It doesn't matter if you're having a good day or a bad day. It doesn't matter if you've fallen on your face a hundred times. It doesn't matter if you've been promoted and therefore think, you know what, you know, I mean, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that deserves God's blessings. I'm sure God's going to leave me for a bit just to keep me humble. It doesn't really matter what's going on in your life. He said he will never loosen his grip on your life. And therefore, you can boldly say, irrespective of what is happening, you know how people use external circumstances and extrapolate that to, uh, to determine their favor with God. Yeah, don't do that, okay? Uh, you might be having a good day or a bad day. God hasn't changed. He will not loosen his grip on your life. So you can always boldly say, the Lord is for me and I will never be afraid of what people may do to me. The Lord will always stand by my side. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me and he will fulfill his word in my life. You should be able to say that confidently because of that consciousness of the rightness of nature that is in you uh, through what Jesus has done. Number eight, a righteous consciousness will give us great freedom and boldness to enter the Father's presence, revolutionizing our prayer life. Okay, um, you know, in in Hebrews um, chapter four, verse sixteen, the Bible says, "Confess your uh, confess your faults, uh, therefore your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray for one another." that you may be healed uh, or restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous available, tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. And that is the, the, um, the amplified version of that passage. Okay, it says the prayer, the continued heartfelt prayer of a righteous man 
makes tremendous, tremendous power available. Dynamic in its working. Tremendous power available. When you pray, your prayer, um, your prayer has great impact in the realm of the spirit. This is somebody who has the very rightness of God speaking in God's presence. Your voice is heard in the spirit. It makes tremendous, not power, tremendous power available. Dynamic in its work. And you release the energies of God into that situation. All of heaven's attention is focused on you because you are a son of God. It's the same thing as if Jesus was praying. That's an incredible thing to even think of, but it's true because you are his rightness. You have his rightness, okay? So it gives us freedom and boldness to enter the Father's presence. Uh, number nine, it gives us boldness before the enemy who accuses us. Um, you know, we read in, um, in Romans 8 earlier that who can stand against us, who can stand successfully against us? Well, the enemy still accuses us. He accuses us in our souls. He accuses us um, through people. There are all kinds of accusations that the enemy levels against us. But it gives us boldness before the enemy who accuses us. If you look at Ephesians 6 verse 16, speaking about the part of the, 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 um, the weapons of our warfare, it says in every, every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Okay, Faith is our wraparound shield. It's a shield that covers you completely. Um, and that faith, is in God's word concerning you. And part of that word concerning you is concerning your acceptance by him. The devil will accuse you and say that you're not worthy. Um, he, will, he will give you all kinds of examples. He will, give, he will bring all kinds of evidence. But no evidence against you is accepted in God's presence. Okay, um, The book concerning your acceptance is closed as far as heaven is concerned. So when we exercise our faith, in our understanding of our rightness with God through the blood of Jesus, it silences every accusation of darkness. So, the I mean, you, you could be cast out a demon and that demon begins to manifest and accuse you and come up with all kinds of things. You can silence it uh, because um, you have faith in your rightness in God. Number 10, righteousness consciousness is a fertilizer um, um, you know, of um, faith, opening the door wide to everything God has for us. You see, faith is a foundation. Um, so righteousness, consciousness fertilizes our faith and it opens the door wide. As I said earlier, there's certain things that you will disqualify yourself from if you are not operating in faith in your righteousness. The basis of your promotion. Uh, the basis of your exaltation in God, the basis of the glory of God that is coming in your direction, the basis of the transfer of wealth and resources that the Lord is putting in your hands uh, so that his kingdom will be advanced. The basis of all those things is the fact that you are one with him. Okay, So it's only as we exercise our faith in this that our hearts are fertilized uh, to, to walk through open doors that he makes available to us. You know, Romans 1.17, uh, the way translation of the Old Testament verse that says, you know, in Habakkuk 2.4, it says that just shall live by his faith. In Romans 1.17, where, where Paul, writing to the Romans, said the, the, the gospel, the, the revelation of the gospel will reveal God's way of making us right with him from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The way translation of that, the just shall live by faith, says it is from the soil of faith that the righteous shall grow up into real life. It's from the soil of faith so that the righteous will grow up into real life. So, so faith in our righteousness is like soil. Okay, It opens the door to everything else. It really does. Um, you know, like that quote I, I, I mentioned earlier, that you will not win unless you feel you're worthy to win. It is only as our hearts are established in righteousness that we'll have the boldness to walk into every door that God has for us um, and lay hold of that which belongs to us in Christ. It's only through that consciousness that we would even entertain the truth of what 
the inheritance of, of what the word re reveals concerning um, our inheritance in God. Okay, the abundant, exceeding great and precious promises that show us our inheritance in God. It's only it's only faith in the the worthiness that we have in Christ that opens the door to that. Um, and then lastly, um, he, um, number 11, it says, righteous consciousness will inhibit sin because righteousness is a power that when yielded to causes our actions to be right. Righteousness consciousness will inhibit sin in our lives because righteousness is a power that when yielded to causes our actions to be right. Uh, we're not acting right to be accepted by God. We are acting right because we're accepted by God and he has empowered us with his nature to be able to live right. Okay, In um, Romans chapter 6, I'm just going to read these incredible verses. I'm going to read six verses from Romans 6, from verses um, um, 13 uh, to 18. It says, so then, refuse to answer its call to surrender, as in sin's call to surrender your body as a tool for wickedness. Instead, passionately answer God's call to keep yielding your body to him as one who has now experienced resurrection life. You live now for his pleasure, ready to be used for his noble purpose. Remember this, sin will not conquer you, for God already has. You're not governed by law, but governed by the reign of the grace of God. What are we to do then? Should we sin to our heart's content since there's no law to condemn us anymore? What a terrible thought. Don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your master? But choose carefully, for you surrender yourself to become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master. And it will own you and reward you with death. But if you choose to love and obey God, he will lead you into, his, into perfect righteousness. And God is pleased with you. For in the past you were servants of sin, but now your obedience is heart deep. <clears throat> and your life is being molded by truth through the teaching you are devoted to. And now you celebrate your freedom from your former master sin. You've left his bondage and now God's perfect righteousness holds power over you as his loving servants. You know, sin no longer has power over us. Christ has freed us from the power of sin because we now have his nature within us. And his nature is powerful. <clears throat> his nature is holy. His nature is, um, is righteous. His nature is just. That is the nature on the inside. We've come created with his laws written within our hearts. And, and they're not just laws as in standards, but they are his, his um, as in standards for us to achieve. They are, they are his, his, um, his nature, and from that nature we act and behave rightly. So the power of sin to control our lives has been broken, but we now have a choice to yield to that nature and to, 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 to reign from the power of that nature and walk in righteousness. Um, because whoever we yield ourselves to, we become a servant to. So we are no longer pre-wired to follow sin as we were in Adam, um, in fallen Adam, and that is. We are now pre-wired to follow righteousness, but we need to, to, need to choose um, to follow um, and yield our members. The more we yield our members to righteousness, the more righteousness actions proceed from, from, from uh, or through our lives. So righteousness consciousness is a foundation for us to reign and rule as new creations and enter into everything that God has for us. Let us embrace, um, let us feast on the grace of righteousness, uh, uh, that the, 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 the fruit of righteousness will have full expression in our lives. Well, thank you for joining me today. I trust you, um, you enjoyed this and, and you, you've received insight. Let us immerse ourselves in these truths and we'll walk in the power of it. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. High Life, we advance.